Hi, Steve from Steve's Makerspace. I'm showing you some of the good pieces that I've been making lately, but this has been a long time coming. This is going to be a bit of a weird video. I'm going to show you what I've been up to the last couple of weeks in generative art, and I've got some cool stuff to show you, but I also want to explore what it means to be an artist. How do you define art? Some thoughts on the creative process and the lows that can come from being a creative. So I might ramble a bit, but I think this will be interesting. After my last couple of videos on tile sampling, I had this post on the P5 Discord share projects page. Uh, this from Eugene Therapy, who is using a piece of his own art and using my tile sampling to tile his art. And this got me thinking, what else could I do? Because I wanted to help him and bring it a little bit further. Now, I'm not actually going to show his art because I don't have his permission, but this is a Monet where I'm doing tile sampling, but I'm using an offset. So if you want to take a look at my tile sampling code from before, you can take a look at that. But this was pretty simple, just adding an extra random offset to the tiles. And then finally, I made this variation, which I call tile sampling rotate chaos. Uh, starts normal at the top left and gets more chaotic at the bottom right. More randomness towards the end, both in the rotation and in the padding between the tiles. So it's coming up with two random values, one for the rotation, one for the width, and it's multiplying by the position that X is in, basically. So if you had a low position, like you're at five, then you're only gonna have a little bit of rotation, but you're, if you're over here at 200, then you're gonna have a lot of rotation. So I shared these things with Eugene Therapy and we had a bit of back and forth. But the takeaway here is that he was riffing off my idea and then I riffed off his idea. So I'm often looking at the share projects section on the P5 website. Also the coding train has a share section where you can look at stuff. This is what I posted. And then there's also a generative discord. This is linked to the Reddit. I'm also looking at the Reddit generative page. I'm also following other generative artists on Twitter, so I'm getting some ideas of what is possible in generative art. And I sometimes follow artists over to their websites as well. So I'm doing a few things here. I'm feeding the creative well. I'm noticing what sorts of techniques might be possible. I'm uh, having some relationship with these other artists. I might be following the artists to their website where they might have a blog and they're talking about their processes. This is my Wavy Lines Art Maker, which I've done a video on before. I wanted to see what would happen if I animated it, and the results are less than stellar. Not really thrilled with it, and I can't figure out why it wants to do this dip here and another sort of a dip here. It seems to be consistent. So then I was looking on Twitter at this guy, Jonathan, who is doing art like this, and I was interested in his rough shapes, basically because these aren't perfect circles, as you can see, there's some randomness in here, which I think is important because you don't want art to be perfect, to have perfect circles. So I did some experiments working on rough circles. So this circle is drawn by rotating the canvas. I start with one radius and then I go uh, in and out, randomly making the radius smaller and larger. But as I get close to the end, I'm at 280 degrees around the circle. I start to get the radius to be back to what it originally started at. So that's how I complete the circle. But unfortunately, using this method, I'm not able to fill the circle. So I tried using the curve vertex to fill the circle, and I got this, sort of an orange slice, which is interesting, not exactly what I wanted. But let me turn the no loop off, and we'll get that. So that's okay. But here's what I came up with for actually filling the circle. So it's uh, instead of rotating the canvas, I'm using cosine and sine to make a circle, except that uh, I've got some randomness for the radius. So if I didn't have any randomness to the radius, it would draw a perfect circle using cosine and sine as it went through the 360 degrees. And again, as it crosses 280 degrees, I'm trying to get closer to where I started with the radius. So this one, I'm trying to use hash marks. This is also using clipping. Uh, if you look up Get Context 2D Clipping, uh, you'll find something on that. So if I get rid of the clip, you'll see that this is actually what's being drawn in the background, but then this clipping function shows only what's within the circle. 
And the way I'm doing the hash marks is a bunch of rectangles. And there's actually two passes for the hash marks. If I get rid of one of the passes for the hash marks, you'll see hash marks only in one direction. If I took this I and J, you'll see the hash marks go in the opposite direction. But I can't just do rectangle I and J twice. I'll show you what happens. It sort of tries to do both at the same time, but you can see it's there's a division here where this part of the circle is horizontal and this part of the circle is vertical. So I actually had to run the process twice in order to get the hash marks. But what's happening here is it's drawing a whole bunch of tiny rectangles from the top left down to the bottom right. But sometimes it's filling the rectangles with white and sometimes it's filling the rectangles with black. Rather than have that completely random, I'm basically turning a switch to have it switch on to black and then switch off to white. So each time it moves, it has a 1 in 10 chance of switching from white to black or black to white. And I'm basically reversing the direction the same way you would reverse the direction of a bouncing ball. So then I saw this guy, Arash Barani, doing this. And you can see a few variations here. So I wanted to see if I could replicate this idea. So I started with this, and I ended with this. I put it aside because I just wasn't getting what I had hoped I would get. So I think what this guy was doing was a lot more complicated than it seems. I'm just going to have to study it some more, but so far it's kind of a mystery to me. So then after experimenting with making shapes, I produced this. I'm going to comment out the tiling part of it, and so it's drawing shapes like this. I already talked about the hashtag drawing. Uh, this is a simple rectangle. This one is using Perlin noise. So here I'm going through that particular rectangle, uh, grabbing some noise, I'm actually using 50% Perlin noise and 50% random noise. I kind of like it better than pure Perlin noise for some reason. And I've already talked about tile sampling in a previous video, but what I'm doing different here is I'm iterating the tile sampling more than once. And rather than rotating the tiles completely randomly, I'm only rotating by either 45 degrees or 90 degrees or 180 degrees. I also thought to actually put the tiling in its own function. So I've got a drawing function and a tiling function. So if I do the drawing function twice and the tiling function once, I get something like this. Or I could do the drawing and then the tiling and then the drawing again and the tiling again. And then I get some more complicated shapes. Now this is interesting, I think, but I don't know that I would call this art. I think it's kind of trying to be art. This one is kind of nice, but I'm not having a lot of success getting good pieces out of this particular process. And I think it's because this drawing is pretty boring. I also have my mini mandala maker, which I've shown on the channel. So I thought I would try doing tiling with this. And this is the result. And I am not really happy with it. So again, kind of a failure. I don't think I would want to put this on my wall to show off to my friends and I wouldn't be posting this to Twitter. So we have our public persona. You probably heard this before on social media, and the same is true with art. We're posting our best art, which makes sense that we would post our best art, but try not to compare what you're doing to what people are posting because they're going through a lot of failures before they get to that good stuff. There's sort of a salesperson point of view here where the salesperson is gonna knock on 10 doors to try to get one sale and they don't think about the nine rejections or they think, great, I've had nine rejections. That means I'm due for a sale. So it's kind of like that with art. You're gonna have lots of failures before you have success. But I have to be honest with you, it was at this point where I wasn't really producing anything that I thought was great that I started to feel low. I think there's an idea that we're only as good as our most recent success. I think YouTube content creators are like that. I think artists are like that. There is a danger to that thinking, of course, because I am not defined purely by what I create. I do define myself as an artist, but that doesn't mean that my value is tied up in what I've produced most recently. But if I could talk about the lows for a minute, I don't suggest that we should try to be depressed. 
Um, clinical depression is a problem. You don't want to get stuck in that. It's hard to pull yourself back out. But you might have a few days where you're just feeling low. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's a fallow period. It's a natural part of the process. There might be gifts in the low space and hanging out in kind of the dark for a little bit. There may be something you're learning. Uh, traditional artists have often explored dark places and gotten healing out of producing from the dark spaces. Now, is it necessary to fix it if you get into a low space? I'm kind of of two minds there. One is, you know, let's hang out in the low space for a little while. But I realized something in my low space. There are several sources of happiness. One of those ways that I create happiness for myself is that I'm doing purposeful activity, something that is making a difference in the world. And so for me, that's the, the coding and the art and the YouTube. But there are other ways to be happy. There are other sources, relationships, uh, getting good exercise, getting good sleep, getting good nutrition. And unfortunately, I've been neglecting those things and getting all of my happiness out of my purposeful activity. And when the purposeful activity dried up, then I was depressed. So I'm working on beefing up those other areas of my life that have been neglected. The other thing that this particular process brings up is the question of what is art? I wouldn't say this is art. It's like it wants to be art, but it's not quite there. So what is art? Art is not decoration. If we Google beach sunset art, we get stuff like this, which is not art. It's stuff that goes with your couch. This is the stuff they put on hotel walls so it won't offend anyone, except that it does offend artists. You know, as an artist, I'd rather look at a blank wall than look at this stuff. Now, I can appreciate the craftsmanship of some of this stuff, and it would be useful to actually try to paint some of this stuff. In fact, if you're a creative coder, I would say try to get out some paintbrushes and go to town, because you might learn something about creative coding while you're painting with a brush. But art needs to have a soul, and it needs to have the possibility of changing the viewer. So if I were to paint one of these, it would be an exercise in craftsmanship, and that's about it. Also with generative art, the creation of art is a collaborative process between the programmer, the program itself, and the user. So it's the user who calls through a lot of the garbage that the program is making and curates. So the user says, okay, this one is art and all the other ones were not art. I think there has to be a human involved in order to call it art, at least right now. Maybe later an AI can decide that this is art, but I don't think we're there quite yet. So now let's finally get to the end. This is the stuff that I'm creating now after my fallow period. I've finally got some success, what I consider success. So this starts off as my wavy lines maker. What I've done differently is that I've randomized each layer so that instead of the user deciding whether there's fill or not or deciding how large the lines are I'm letting the computer decide that and I'm letting it decide that for each layer so that's each layer of the original drawing then we're doing tile sampling but instead of doing tile sampling like I did before where, where they're all equal squares I'm uh, giving it some space and I'm making the tiles different sizes. So a random X size, a random Y size for each tile. And I've also got rotation. I can turn the rotation off, so I'm just getting tiles and no rotation in this case. But if I turn the rotation back on, now I'm getting rotation. And this one is iterating once. If I iterate twice, it gets a little more complicated. So here's where I'm randomizing the tile width and the tile height. I've got the frame being randomized. The padding is being randomized. Here are my iterations. This is how many times I'm going to go through the tiling process. I have a chance out of 100 that it's going to show the tile. So if I were to change this to, say, 20 out of 100, then you're going to see a lot more white space, basically. Whereas if I change this to 100 out of 100, then you're going to see lots of tiles, which is easier to see if I change the rotating to false. Now you can see this is my old tile sampling. So we'll put that back to true and put this down to 50% or so. Let's bump it up to 
That's better. Right at the end, I've got a rectangle drawing around the frame just to lop off some of the stuff that was going off the side of the page. So this piece is using randomness to create the white spaces. What if instead I use Perl and Noise to create the white space? So this is what you normally see with Perl and Noise, these points that make this gradual shape changing. But what if I rounded this? Now it's rounding to zero or one and I get black shapes and white shapes that are pretty distinct. So what if now I took my tiles or my shapes and I placed them where the black is and where there's white, I don't place anything. So I think that'll be an interesting area to explore next. So that's gonna do it for today's video. I hope this was worth watching. I'll leave a link to this art maker in the description and maybe a couple other links. If there's something I was showing that I didn't link to, let me know in the comments. I'm really interested in your comments to what I've shared with you today. If you like this, you can give it a like, consider subscribing to the channel, ring the bell for notifications. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.